Welcome to Dear Romance Writer, where three writers who always deliver happily ever afters offer questionable advice for all of your relationship, work, and life problems. I'm Zio Axelrod. I'm Avery Flynn. And I'm Rowan Parrish. We have a great show for you today with our special guest, Elizabeth Hunter. Yay. 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 Thank you for having me. <laughs> yes, it's such a pleasure. Will you introduce yourself? Tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Um, well, my pen name is Elizabeth Hunter, and I write uh, romance. I write fantasy romance. I write paranormal mystery. I've been writing for about 10 years now, so I've, I've switched things up a little bit, but uh, romance is my, I would say my primary genre. All my books have some element of romance. Um, and I'm here, I'm excited about my um, new release coming later this month called Double Vision. Oh, yeah. And I will put up a little Ooh. backwards cover here for, uh, for the YouTube viewers. <laughs> and uh, it's coming out on April 19th. And it's really fun. It's a brand new series. So it's first in series. And um, yeah, I'm excited about it. It's got a lot of humor. It's It would be classified as paranormal women's fiction. So our, all of our characters are like, 40 and up and kind of exploring that part of their life and family. And there's just lots of really cool friendships, lots of chatting, um, lots of conversations and probably a lot of questionable advice. So I feel like <laughs> it's a really good fit for this podcast. Oh, Great. Good. This you is relevant. Good. And it's a gorgeous <laughs> cover. So if you guys yeah, are listening, you should definitely. Thank you so it. much. Thanks. Yeah, it's beautiful. very pretty. Is it part of a series? Well, it is. It's going to be a trilogy. So each book will feature a different, there's three friends featured in the book that meet in the very first book. And then um, they have, um, are struck by sudden psychic abilities. Ooh. Yes. And uh, after having otherwise normal lives, and then they have to solve mysteries and, and deal with the odd things that this new life throws at them um, by being, you know, with, while also, you know, being awesome new besties and uh supporting each other so there's a lot about friendship in all my paranormal women's fiction so that's that's really fun for me nice that sounds delightful yeah so um, each book has a different there's yeah there's three and each one features a different friend as the main character that Very cool. uh well speaking of books uh i want to know what everyone's reading this week because i feel like i don't know in philly at least it has been like a, a rain it's Gray. just we are just, soaked yeah week great yeah. for reading and things dc yeah. has been gross too not gonna really? lie not gonna lie at all yeah our Elizabeth's out in the sunshine she's out in the sunshine yeah, it's really it's nice out. here <laughs> <laughs> except you know it's what? gonna be it's gonna be 97 today so we're getting very hot what? very fast and yeah. elizabeth oh. it was lovely having you we hope you have a nice life <laughs> Bye. I'm jealous. Okay. And then, but thankfully next week it's going it's going down back into like the 80s again yeah. so yeah there, listen right. pay high property taxes for a reason people there you go mm -hmm. <laughs> um well i am in my circle of romance mystery thrillers paranormal nonfiction romance i am at the nonfiction era book uh, before I dive back into romance. And so this is a true crime book. It's called Under the Banner of Heaven. And it, oh, Roan Ron knows this book. Okay, so I guess there's going to be like a show on Hulu um, with Andrew Garfield. And there oh, it is yeah. a true crime. It is about this murder in Mormon country in Utah in the early 80s late 70s early 80s right around there i think it's the early i think 80s. i saw a documentary about this the lafferty brothers oh, i think okay. so yeah was oh, it yeah. like stolen documents or like forged documents or something no like that? but i watched that that was oh, okay great. there is a tie-in okay. to that though oh. um, but so the book is called under the banner of heaven and that's also what the hulu show is going to be and it's by john Krakauer. yeah um it's a little slow in the beginning, uh, but then it is, um, it definitely picks up speed. And if you are like me and don't have a lot of history about Mormonism or the religion or the history of it or all that stuff, it definitely fills you in. There's been a lot of jaw drop moments for me, for sure. And um, also what's been really interesting to read is the book came out in the early 2000s. 
and he refers to people who get like like Warren Jeffs, who was a fundamentalist Mormon who got busted for like child uh, child sexual assault and all sorts of things. And mm-hmm. it's talking about how Warren Jeffs just took over this fundamentalist sect. And I'm like, I know that name. Why do I know that name? And so to go look it up. Whoa. So um, it's really interesting. I think I've got like two chapters left to go and it has gotten to be one of those books where I read it in like three minute spurts while the coffee is brewing. You know, that's when you know, like you've been sucked into the book. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I give that a um, thumbs up. I'm sure you can find it in your library, if not anywhere else. That sounds really good. So, yeah. yeah, that sounds really good. What are you guys reading? I am juggling as usual, listening and listening to one and reading the other one in the ebook. Um, I'm listening to Dear Mr. Brody from A.M. Johnson, which is I think the fourth book in this series, which started with since um, Love Always Wilder, which is just like, it's set sort of in the literary world. So you have like agents and authors and stuff. Um, it's a gay romance series. It's just really good. I just love um, their writing. It's just really good. Um, and I'm reading a non-romance. So I'm in your boat there, Avery. Um, it's called Someday Maybe by Onyi Wabanelli. I'm probably saying the last name wrong, but it's coming out in October and it is women's fiction. She is British. She's a British woman of Nigerian descent. So there's a lot of like about her family in there, but it's about a young widow um, and just dealing with her grief of the loss of her husband and all kinds of stuff is happening with his family and her family. And it's, but the writing is so beautiful. So I'm like in the middle of that and I'm like staying up till two in the morning toothpicks yeah. in my eyes trying to read this book because it's so good it's really, really good yeah but it's called someday that. Maybe. when you know you should stop what was it again can't. someday maybe someday maybe oh mm-hmm. i have heard of that one too yeah the cover is gorgeous too yeah yeah the cover is really gorgeous too so um, i think that one will do really well when it comes out this fall nice you got an advanced copy i did <laughs> cool um I just started I have been on a break because I just finished a couple of projects so like I have not been reading much but I am I'll give you guys a tiny clue if anyone's listening then I'm going to tell them there's a I, they can listen for a um an easter egg I'm starting a brand new series completely relate unrelated to any of my other series later this year and so mm-hmm. I am um Re- I just started reading. I was looking at that's why I was looking off screen. I'm like, who was the other? Who was the other? Um, it was shoot, uh, Graham Hancock, The Sign and the Seal. And it's uh, historical, it's about the history of the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's East African uh, history and kind of the mythology and stories related to that how much of it is history how much of it is mythology and oral tradition and Mm -hmm. um yeah so that I will tell you that is related to the series that I'm starting later this year which is another uh romantic fantasy series oh that's quite a teaser (laughs) oh I love a teaser yeah Yeah, I'm kidding um that is the most I've said about the series actually so I'm going (laughs) to tell people like I have said something but you're gonna to have to listen to the podcast. <laughs> Little hints. Yeah. Um, I'm oh, I'm in the the uh, finishing one book and about to start another. I have like one chapter left of um, Manhunt by Gretchen Felker Martin, which um, is it's great. It's so brutal. It is. Uh, so you might have heard of it lately because it just came out, but also because um, there was just that whole hullabaloo about. I forget that um, the the men that book the gender side book where that person was yeah. like, oh yeah, it's got great trans representation, and then someone read it and it was like Not so, so trans that everyone wanted to die. Oh. Um, well, so Manhunt is um, written by a trans woman about a, a kind of like post gender side situation where men are turned to animals kind of like reduced to base instincts in a zombie like way and it's told from the the point of view of two trans women and a trans man um who like because it is a a genetic um 
issue like it's it's chromosomal mm -hmm. uh these folks are like the the trans women are going around and trying to hunt the turfs that are attempting to kill them it's become like a worldwide movement or not become in this book like today it is a worldwide movement but they're like a violent movement and mm -hmm. they to get estrogen are trying to kill the men who have been um, ravaged by this disease and basically like eat their testicles because if you wow. have an overabundance of testosterone in your body it converts to estrogen and vice versa um and so it's about like their attempt at survival and what's happening in this world and then there's also a reason like a fertility scientist um who is helping people get pregnant but what do you do it when like the fetus in your body might turn into a child that could like eat its way out of you because it is stricken with a disease that makes it just want to eat it's really brutal wow. like every trigger warning imaginable imaginable um but her prose is amazing like this book slaps the prose is so gory and gorgeous um and it is just such a well done version of like a gender side book by a trans person when most of the books that are about that are like oh right trans people exist oops I want to write my book anyway um so that is awesome highly recommend but it's super gory and what's then, the title again uh, man manhunt 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 it's got a great cover I feel um, like that may lay a little bit too much into horror for me yeah it's it, definitely it, yeah if it's really graphic I, I will probably yeah yeah it is, my it, entire it, time it, like, I'm terrible <laughs> like I can write gross things but like watching that I don't watch like super scary movies either like I'm such a chicken yeah, no, that's I can fair. write that's totally cutting fair. people's heads off and stuff but don't make me watch it I'm terrible about it's, it. it's different it's really different um it's, the, the premise is amazing cool. like that is super imaginative I love that yeah yeah the yeah. premise is awesome. Execution, gory and great. If that's your thing, gory and too scary, maybe if that's not your thing. Um, but I'm really excited. Also, I just, I'm like making sure I get the title right. I just downloaded the audiobook of How High We Go in the Dark by Sequoia Nagamatsu, which um, I have been wanting to read for forever. And it just came through in my uh, queue in the library. And it's about, it's, it's uh, set in multiple time periods, but it's about a scientist who is in the Arctic. And like, at this point in science in the world, they, uh, the ice, the polar ice caps melting has let certain diseases that we have been um, taking oh, care of. This feels too yeah. close to reality. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely like, um, it, I don't think it's quite as plaguey as covid is but it's definitely about like what do you what do you do in a world when uh certain realities yeah. mean that mm -hmm. realities will no longer be able to exist um so i haven't started that one yet but i've heard amazing things i'm really excited about to start yeah, it tonight awesome oh they both sound great all of them sound yeah. great i i i dig scientific thrillers i tend to like yeah. like the original jurassic park like there was oh, so much science in that. And, and I was like, this is so cool. I don't know how accurate it is. Don't ask me that. I'm not a scientist, yeah, but care. like, if it sounds sciencey, I'll buy it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the same. Oh, you guys are a mess. I love it. All right. So there are your book racks. Everybody can go download now. Yeah. That's Just like warning a, you, that's... the sign and the seal is about that thick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm plowing oh, through for research reasons, but mm, it's a lot. It's My husband's read it up entirely, of course. <laughs> yeah, I just speaking of thick books, I just got the um the paperback. Oh, of I saw, saw that, that behind you. Look at this thing. <laughs> it's huge. But let's look at that cover Ooh. because oh, oh my it's beautiful. God, it's so yeah. beautiful. It's just stunning. That I mean, cover. I first saw it, I was yeah. like, seriously, it's just beautiful who, uh, Zio, who did that cover who did i don't know cover? i'd have to ask sky i have no oh idea oh my god it's so it's beautiful stunning um and for those and of you who imagery. are listening um and maybe missed that uh the book that Zio was holding up is nightingale and that yeah, is nightingale. a charity anthology to benefit ukraine and how many authors have books in there it's like or, 50 53 54 or something like that stories yeah, yeah. it's yeah it's over it's 800 pages um massive. there's short stories there class. are like bonus epilogues there's bonus chapters like all kinds of stuff but yeah it's it's, it's pretty cool i was really really 
honored that she asked me to be a part of it. And it was really quick. Like usually when you, you know, when we do anthologies, you have a few months, you know, you're writing, you're editing, you're doing this. And then there's the marketing. All this stuff. This was like a month ago. She was like, can you give me something to put in here? And then like two weeks later, it was on pre-order. It's, it's amazing. The response has been fantastic. So thank you to everyone who's picked it up because we're going to raise some money for these people who desperately need it. That's so amazing. And I feel like that is, that gives the lie to anyone who critiques romance writers for writing fast. It's like, well, you know what you can do when you are used to being able to draft fast is write things so that you can raise a bunch of money for people who really need it. So far. Yeah. 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 I mean, and there's, a, there are several, and I can't think of the titles, but I know there's a historical romance one. There was a fantasy romance one, a, a anthology. Um, so there's, there are a couple of projects out there that are raising money. So yeah. yeah, Romance Landia, when it steps up, it really steps up. It Absolutely. does. <sighs> so let's get to our letter, which actually today does not come from Emma the Asshole for change. Um, we went to another channel of Reddit, <laughs> the rela- <laughs> our relationship the channel. question the same though? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They can be, they can be. <laughs> I've been saving a bunch of them this week. because, like some of them, I'm like, this has to be fake. This can't be real. People aren't really like this, are they? But you know, they are. but this one says my boyfriend at 27 male says I 25 female am straining our relationship by not sleeping with someone else after he cheated. <laughs> yeah. Like we got Elizabeth. You guys have to go to YouTube and see Elizabeth's face. <laughs> yeah. This is I already have so many thoughts. Yeah. So many. So Here's the crux of it. He cheated several months ago. He cried and begged for forgiveness. I can't say I fully forgave him, but I did take him back and put effort into working things through. He said I can have a quote unquote free pass and sleep with someone else to make it quote unquote fair so he won't feel guilty. It's been months and I haven't used my free pass, but he sure is worried whenever I hang out with any of my guy friends. He doesn't know when I'm going to sleep with one of them. I honestly don't have sympathy for him worrying. He gets anxious that I might sleep with someone else, but that's exactly what he already did without my knowledge or consent. He implied he just wants me to get it over with, with someone I'm not going to see again. He doesn't like the strain it's causing in our relationship. (laughs) Sorry, I just laugh break. Knowing there's always a possibility I will sleep with someone else. Despite the past months of, of officially being together, our relationship already over because he already broke it once by cheating and I find myself not caring when he's hurt by not knowing whether I'm having sex with one of my guy friends while I'm out. Part of me does feel bad that I didn't just end it after he broke the relationship by cheating because he has spent months appearing to genuinely care. But I also think if he cared, he wouldn't have cheated. I have trouble respecting him after what he did and he does not respect me enough to not cheat. Is this already over? (laughs) Yes. You have answered your question. (laughs) Never mind. No, what, this was a short question. This was a short... <laughs> all right. Thanks. See you all next week. Yeah. yeah. No. A, this was a great podcast, you guys. Thanks so much for asking me here. The, the uh, gaslighting on this one. Yeah. Is, is I number so one. Many number thoughts. two. For the really old amongst us who remember Fantasy Island, this was an episode on Fantasy Island. Was I am it? not was lying. It? I, yes. I don't there was I, one where it was a married the show, couple. But I don't re- remember like individual episodes. But this, oh, this one stuck like in my episode. my my child brain because I love the drama and the mess. What's so uh, yeah, the husband cheated on the wife, and they went to Fantasy Island because she had a free pass. And then he spent the entire episode like trying to beat up every guy that talked to her, right? So number one, that's, that's, those are my two trigger things. But the gaslighting in this, and I think it's also, you know, I think at least for me, when you are younger, you're like, there are deal breakers in a relationship, you know, you know, I'd, I'd walk away immediately, no matter what for X, Y, Z, whatever it may be for you. Mm -hmm. And I think as you get older and you get kind of embroiled in relationships more, and maybe you have a mortgage together or kids together or a pet or whatever it may be. Sometimes you're like, okay, well, maybe there's a way to come back from something like that. Cheating is a huge deal breaker for a lot of folks. Right. Mm -hmm. So I can understand that urge to kind of okay, he apologized, we'll make our way forward, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's a choice that some folks make. Not Mm -hmm. saying it's right or wrong. It's just a choice that some folks make, um, no matter which party it is. But when she says, I don't care anymore that he's upset. When a woman says she doesn't care anymore, 
it really doesn't it's dead it is stick a fork in it it's done salt the earth it, there is no bringing it that's back. in my experience that is 100 percent true mm-hmm. like i have been um i've been divorced i'm remarried now but um i remember going through my first divorce which I tried really hard for 11, 12 years to avoid. And, and, and my, um, there was no infidelity. There was nothing like that. It was just not a healthy relationship. And, uh, but I remember, and we had a child together. So like, there's all these layers, like you were talking about. Um, Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to my divorce attorney who was, who was really great actually. And she's, she was telling me, um, you know, usually, um, she said, if a man comes to me and wants to hire me, um, I often, it often, uh, the divorce doesn't finalize, um, that there will be some kind of reconciliation, some, something like that. She said, when women file, they are almost always like they have avoided this for the longest time. If they file, they're done. Like they're really, really done. Um, And, and that's where I was uh, having been in this. I get my, I have a question about the premise because I think my response to this, you know, I had my quick, quick take response, but um, my response to this as a, I guess, as a larger question for people who might be in similar situations is um, what kind of girlfriend, boyfriend are we talking about? Are we talking about like, you guys are together and you're not interested in marriage, but you are committed for the long haul and you're just going to be, you know, partners, long-term partners. Um, that is one kind of girlfriend, boyfriend relationship. Um, do you want to get married? And this is a step for you. You are trying out this person as a partner and you have not committed to them for the long term marriage, uh, civil partnership, whatever that may be. Um, if you were in the trying out phase and he cheated on you, you done tried it out. <laughs> and in my opinion, it's not working. Like the tryout is, is over. Didn't trial is over. It didn't fit. <laughs> didn't fit for whatever reason that may have probably nothing to do with you. It didn't fit move on. Like that's, I understand being in a committed relationship and having history and like, Hey, we're in this for the long haul, whether we're married or not. And like saying, having infidelity and saying like, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna work past this. We're going to get counseling. We're going to fix what's broken because, because there's a thing here that we want to preserve, even though Mm -hmm. it's been damaged. They're young, like 25, 27, you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to see how long they'd been together, but it doesn't say. I I would be curious about that too. It just says that that it happened several months ago. The thing that I don't understand is if you don't care, what are you holding on to? Like if you don't care that he's upset, if you don't care that, yeah, that's what it seems like. It seems like it's like that. She's going to get hers while she can. And I mean... I'm not going to say it's right or wrong. I've never, I've never been in that situation. So, but um, I think this guy is deluded if he thinks that this is going to resolve itself if she sleeps with somebody else. And she is too, if she thinks that he, if she believes that, because this is only going to turn into another issue, he's never going to drop it. He hasn't dropped this. He was the one who did it. Can we talk about that concept of a free pass? Sure. What do you guys think about that? Honestly? Well, I think it's that was the, go row. Like, you go row. Well, I was just gonna say that that was the part that stuck out the most to me too, because I think that like first of all, to me, free pass suggests that this is a monogamous, it's supposed to be a monogamous relationship, and that mm-hmm. free pass is like uh like writing in an exception to what you both already agreed about. But like, if you both already agreed that you want a monogamous relationship and the the, the boyfriend cheated, um, that doesn't mean that the girlfriend stops wanting a monogamous relationship and suddenly wants to have sex with someone else. Like those mm-hmm. two things are completely unrelated. So mm-hmm. a free pass in this instance to me 
isn't like I'm giving you something that I know you want. It's I want you to do something that you don't want to do because I think that once you do a bad thing, it will somehow equal the bad balance thing it out. I yeah, and I can stop feeling guilty. But yeah, of course, oh, it's a hundred percent about oh, him not wanting to feel guilty. Yeah. Anymore. yeah. 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 And I think this it's isn't a make good. Because, this is a make me feel better. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's interesting because I, I feel like the free pass was like a thing that the boyfriend actually said, like a quote. Um, like I assume that that's his language. And I think that that tells us a lot about what we need to know about what his view of a relationship is. Like if his view of a relationship is, yay, you, you get a free pass. That means being monogamous with you, my partner is a hardship and I hew to it because mm. you made it like worth my while to stay thus far, but mm-hmm. who knows, right? And I think that that is a really good like uh, insight into the state of mind of this man who mm-hmm. uh, clearly feels really guilty about what he did. But interestingly, like he told her, I don't think it's that, I, I got the sense that he confessed, right? Did she say that? That's she's, what I was actually, I was out. just looking and she doesn't say. She doesn't, she doesn't say. say if huh. she caught him or oh, okay. if he confessed okay. or if right. somebody, like one of his buddies slipped, who knows? Yeah. Right. So exactly. the, the pride and begged for forgiveness without the, like, I caught him. I guess I just assumed that he told her, <laughs> but that's not stated, but it definitely does seem like uh, this is someone who's like super preoccupied with his own guilt. So either he told her or when she found out he cried and begged and was like, I'm going to give you the one thing that I know everyone secretly wants to make it even, which is you get to go have sex with someone who isn't me, your chosen partner. And I just think that that is like, that is, um, that's a real clear state of mind. Mm -hmm. We're spoiling their relationship down to something, one, very transactional. Yeah. And mm-hmm. two, very physical. Yeah. 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 And I think like, why, why on earth would you assume that, it, like you said, why, why on earth would you assume that she would want that? Because you want right. it, obviously. Exactly. But you're, not, you're not in her head. You're not, yeah, throw the whole man away. No. Yeah. And I think that that's why to me, it's like I, I, every relationship is so different. There are lots of people who um, have issues with infidelity and come back from it. There are lots of people who don't come back from it. So like, to me, the cheating, it has like, I have no opinion about that whatsoever, about what you should do. Cause it just depends on if you can get over it or not. Mm-hmm. But like, you seem like you're coming from really different places in this relationship. Mm-hmm. Like if to him, a free pass is a positive, like lucky you and to you it's a negative then right away you view the relationship completely differently and your desires are really different and so I think that's like reason enough why it might not work out even if the cheating hadn't happened and so to me this is like not really about getting over the the cheating or like taking the free pass or whatever this is really about her being like I don't care that he feels bad because he already made me feel bad and that to me is very transactional and he's like I did a bad thing. So now you do a bad thing. And that's very transactional, but they're not like using the same units of value for these transactions. They're yes. both bad. Well, yeah. and one thing that I'm curious about is if like, cause she doesn't say, she doesn't say if she's like, I, I love him. This relationship is valuable to me. Yeah, there's nothing in there so about that. I'm going to try and get over this. I believe I can get over this. Like, did that come from a genuine place of saying, I'm going to try and work my way through this? Sometimes you can love somebody and work your way through it. And there go the dog. Sorry. And sometimes my you can love somebody and, and feel like you should be able to get over something whether it's infidelity or some other emotional harm that has been done to you but you just genuinely cannot and so I think that to me I wonder about is did she start this supposed journey from a place of I genuinely do want to forgive or did she start from a place of well I guess I should want to forgive him and give Mm, this another chance because he feels bad one of the things the language i'm looking at here she doesn't say that she doesn't want to use her free pass she says i haven't used my free pass yet 
He doesn't know when I'm going to sleep with one of them. She doesn't say that she doesn't want to use. Well, she doesn't say she she does say she doesn't know when she's going to sleep with one of them. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like she she might be dangling this over his head. Like you don't know when it's going to happen. It's you know, and he's saying just do it. Either one of them would want to continue with this relationship. I don't either. She is basically torturing him after he did a really shitty thing, which. You know, this is yeah. This while is, on this one sounds... hand, we don't support that. On the other <laughs> hand, we're all laughing. So yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. It's, it sounds I'm like put, a really broken. I'm putting myself really back in trying to remember like where my headspace was when I was 25 because you know I am ancient now. Um, so it was a while ago. And I, you know, I guess I remember at 25 feeling like I was very, like, getting up there, uh, you know, like, if I hadn't, if I hadn't been married in a relationship, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be an old maid, you know, in Regency England or something, you know, it's like feeling like I want to be progressing toward a, you know, marriage or long-term partnership or cohab or whatever, you know, and if they've been like, I'm imagining if they've been together since college or right after college or something like that, and they've got a couple of years invested in this, she feels like well, I'm 25 already, you know, it's getting, it's getting, older. It, yeah. and I've already got two years, you know, because when you're 25, you think that is not, you know, you have no perspective at that age. Like I think back to 25 and like, good Lord, woman, you're a baby. You have so much time to meet much nicer people and have a relationship with them. But that's not where you are when you're, when you're that age. And, and you're thinking I've already invested two years and that seems like a really long time. Mm-hmm. And I don't yeah, want that time to be a waste. And so I feel like she's trying to talk herself into the this being a relationship that she wants but i don't yeah she doesn't she says she doesn't care anymore yeah she doesn't care yeah. if you're 25 and and listening to this you have lots of time to find someone amazing and you will be sorry if you settle for someone who is cheating on you when you are dating don't do that and just opening that door say she sleeps with someone so where do they go from there you know, yeah. if it again, if he if it happens again, well, you know, they've you're you're Let's you're introducing something path. to really yeah, another free path. Like how many? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this just sounds like a chalk it up to a life experience and walk away situation. But that would be yeah. my advice. Yeah, I think or or work. revisit the idea of monogamy because you know there's that as well. But you know, you could yeah. do. Uh, mm, I didn't get that feeling that. No, I don't either, but yeah. I'm just saying that's, a, that's an option for some. That's an option for as well. Definitely an option for some. I don't feel like either of them. I think it's interesting that he's still in this. I actually kind of find that interesting because it's he's still hard. pushing for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I disagree with what she says at the end. Uh, if he cared, he wouldn't have cheated. Um hmm. Like, I think lots of people cheat when they care. There are a million, there's as many ways or reasons for cheating as yeah. there are people, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that like over and over when, when you were reading this out loud, I just kept being like, I fundamentally disagree with this premise. I fundamentally disagree with this premise. So it's clear to me that this is like a person who has a really, really different idea of relationships than I do. So I don't mm-hmm. know if like my particular advice would be at all useful to someone since we're clearly coming from like really different places. But I do think that if you're I, 25 to me is like the perfect age to be, um, to be figuring out like what is my ideal relationship look mm-hmm. like for me? And I, I guess more than almost anything else, what I hope this, this letter writer takes away, whether they stay with this dude or not, is like someone else setting the rules in my relationship doesn't mean that I have to follow those rules. And like someone else believing yes. that the way to make cheating okay is to like make it fair. Um, that is... 
I, I would really believe that maybe this is the first time this person has been cheated on and the first long-term partner that she's had at 25, you know, it could I be get that feeling, time, but it could also be her first. And mm-hmm. I feel like there is so much work that the boyfriend's language is doing to shape the reality of this relationship and the way that she wrote this letter that mm-hmm. I just want her to throw out these words. Like I want her to throw out words like, uh, like free pass and he doesn't he didn't care or he wouldn't have done this thing or I don't care if he's hurt etc etc like to me those aren't doing any useful work here they're just regurgitating relationship scripts that we are taught to internalize without thinking about them by watching tv and we're we're, we hear like people's girlfriends being like oh no you you can do so much better and so like we repeat that but like the root of this relationship is in question and I feel like this is a good time for this letter writer to talk to her boyfriend and be like what do you like about me what do you like about our relationship and ask herself like what do I like about him what do I like about our relationship because if you can get to the point where your partner cheats on you and gives you a free pass and you are like I don't care about hurting him then I think that you letter writer on your own need to do some real work to figure out like, who am I in relationships? What does love mean to me? What does it mean to be a good partner? And I'm not saying that you did something wrong because your partner cheated on you. Absolutely not. But to me, he's, he's like a write-off at this point. You're obviously gonna, like your, your relationship is obviously over, but to get something useful out of it would be like, use this and ask like, what would I have done if, and then think about every single scenario. And, and to me, that is like much more valuable than asking a question about like, what would make this fair? If I don't care, does it mean I, that X, Y, or Z? Like, no, having one feeling doesn't ever always for everyone automatically mean this is what the, the thought was that preceded the feeling. Like those generalizations are so useless to me. So yeah, I, I really hope that, um, whatever happens with this relationship that the letter writer is like is this the person I want to be in a relationship because I don't mm-hmm. think it is the person most people want it, to be that, that letter doesn't really reflect well in either of them no no no, no. and really like they honestly, both just have a lot of a lot of like Ron said like a lot of soul searching to do and figuring out who they are as people individually and together you know yeah. well and those are great questions to ask yourself when and and I don't think we make sort of a priority to ask ourselves those questions especially at that age because we're so again you know you feel such weird pressures at 25 I agree yeah that that sometimes it's hard to take that step back and ask those questions around that that are really great what is a good relationship to me how does what do I what am I looking for in a partner what kind of partner do I want to be and, and the thing is, is those questions don't stop when you're 25 mm-hmm. and the, and you shouldn't stop asking yourself those questions, even as you get older, even as you're in a relationship, because your answers change, you know, um, and, and what you look for in a partner and what you want from your partner, even if it's been the same partner for, you know, 10 years can change, mm-hmm. hopefully People not change. at its core, but you know we're constantly changing great evolving, questions so. to everyone is to ask yourself well yeah. and i think yeah and that is a really good like you said a really good age to start asking yourself those questions like what kind of adult relationship committed relationship if i want that what kind do i want what kind of role do i see for myself as part of this relationship And then what kind of partner is going to suit me and change with me and grow with me? Um, You know, some people are more static by nature. You know, some people don't change as much, whereas other people are, you know, get passionate about this thing. And then they, you know, maybe spend a couple of years on that and then they get, they, they find a new passion about like another thing or they change they like changing jobs more often that can be super stressful for the wrong partner right Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. it's not all about love and I guess I that was that would be one piece of advice I would give this young woman it's like you can love someone you can genuinely love someone and have them not be the right person for you Mm -hmm. absolutely if 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 a long-term committed partnership is what you want and not everybody wants that you can, you can absolutely love someone passionately, 
sincerely, deeply, and have them not be a, a good partner for you at all. True. And I think this age, 25, 26, 27, is when your friends start to develop long-term relationships. You start seeing people getting engaged and married and having kids and stuff. And that can put an, a, an additional amount of pressure on you. Like, okay, well, this person I went to college with is already married with a kid. What's wrong with me? Like, I need to make this work. Yeah. You know, there's that pressure as well. Like, I, I have to hang on to this. And if there's a problem, we just fix it and move on. And, you know, taking a step back and saying, let's let's call this off or let's we'd be better as friends or whatever it is, is not a failure. And I think a lot of times in society, we look at it that way, especially if you've been socialized as, as a woman, it's like a failure. If We're something really like hard on ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Definitely. And I also, as folks who are socialized as women, I think are taught generally that like our job in a relationship is reactive more than decisive. And that is something that I saw so much with my friends when I was in my early and mid twenties was like female friends being like, well, I want X, Y, or Z, but he wants this, this, and this. So I guess what I have to do is, and it was like a math problem of like, this is what my date wants or thinks is acceptable. So how can I non-confrontationally and non-directly figure out how to get what I want and what I need. And I think that that is like, we are not taught. I mean, I was never taught like by as either as a kid or in school, how to negotiate, like getting your needs met. This is not a thing that we're taught. We watch and we observe and we're like, oh, the people who have the most luck kind of play games and they don't say exactly what they want or they see what someone else wants first. And then they decide like, okay, well, I guess that's what I can have. So I'll, I'll match my desire to what I know I'm able to have so that I don't feel foolish or get mm-hmm. hurt or any of those things. And I think like that is so understandable as a position, but it is a habit that if you fall into it in your early and mid twenties, it is so much harder to crawl your way out of it when you're older and be like, oh, actually my desires are not dependent on the whims of another person who I happened to go out on two dates with. Like go into things and be like, I decide what I want. And and the other person's reaction is to me, not the other way around. And that is a lesson that I think like so so few people in general are taught, um, but that if you find yourself letter writer in a position like you're in now where like your boyfriend acted and is having feelings. And now the position that you're in is like as a reactor or someone who's like, am I gonna fulfill his expectations or disappoint Mm -hmm. them? Mm-hmm. Those aren't the only two options. You can have your own expectations and you can go out and you can decide what you want in a person, what you want in yourself. And like, none of that has to be formulated based on the things that you know this person already wants. Cause then mm-hmm. you're starting already with like 98.7% of possibilities off the table. If you're just going based on what someone else wants. So I invite you to like put all those possibilities back on the table, stop being in a position where you're only reactive in relationships and figure out what you want for yourself in yourself, and then make sure that whoever you date next knows about those desires and requirements. So we're all, we're, we all agree this is over. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's I think over. She knows, I, I think, think we, she knows that it's over. Yeah, yeah. I think so too. Yeah. She knows. She knows. Um, and the, what I it. know is next is our chat topic. Ooh. So that's my <laughs> transition. You like that? That was my okay. power transition. So note good. from my editor would be let's soften that a little. So um <laughs> but you're being direct and yes. telling us what you need. There you go. And I respect there you go. That. I am I am not reacting, I'm acting. Um <laughs> And speaking of acting, it is um, not acting like actor, but acting as in like doing stuff. Uh, we've got the, uh, it's book signing season just about to start up. Oh, again. yeah. And it has been a couple of years since we've been able to really get out for the most part and do this. And I know it's still a little worrisome for, for folks for different reasons. So, um, you know, for those of you who are going back out into signing season, uh, what kind do you love book signings? Do you hate book signings? Do you, um, you know, do you have horror stories? Do you have funny stories? <laughs> do you have tips for surviving? Um, you know, what do you do? And I have to tell you guys first that I had never been to a book signing until I was an author. 
and I was signing at one. Yeah, so same. I went in completely blank, and the readers who go to these are hardcore. <laughs> I love they and admire business. them, but I yeah. am like, wow, wow, your commitment to drive across the country and stay in a hotel for three nights and you know do all this stuff. I am utterly impressed by their commitment, mm-hmm. quite mm-hmm. frankly. So yes, take it away. Tell me your tell me your your book signing stories and advice. Uh, my first book signing was in 2012. So am I the oldest book signing lady here? Yes. Okay. Uh, I feel like an old book signing lady. Um, <laughs> so that was actually, it was the, the infamous book signing in Chicago that was like, Colleen Hoover and Abby Glines and gosh, um, was Yale James there? I think Yale James might have been there. And um, there were a bunch of us that were like early self publishers, and it was kind of one of the first um, indie organized um, romance signings. Mm-hmm. I think ever like indie publishing was still really new. So the idea, you know, because it used to be that, um, you know, you would have a book signing as an author. If your agent set it up with a bookstore and you would go to a series of bookstores, you would have a book tour. Um, if you were a big enough name and you would go to bookstores and they, you would do like a reading maybe, or, and then people would buy your book and they would, they would come in. And, and if you were an indie author, none of those options was available to you mm-hmm. at the time. Bookstores didn't want to give us the time of day. Um, so that was my very first book um, signing experience. And it was, yeah, I was in Chicago. I want to say it was two, yeah, it was 2012. And um, I mean, it, and it was a blast and it was not nearly like there weren't as nearly as many readers <laughs> as there are at something like Book Bonanza because people were still trying to figure out like, how does this work? Mm-hmm. And then for a period of about, I want to say three or four years, there was just like this explosion and there were so many of them all over the country. And um, I didn't do a lot of them. I was a single parent at the time. My son was still in elementary school. Like it just wasn't very feasible for me to be going from city to city once a month for a book signing. Like it just wasn't going to happen. So I, mm-hmm. I like, I tried to do like at least one a year, maybe two, um, which I think was a benefit to me because as much as I love book signings, there's a limited amount, like you don't make a ton of money off of them. I think there's Mm -hmm. some like this, there's this misconception among readers that like, oh my God, you're selling so many books. But like when you factor in like going to the hotel and paying table fees, you don't make really a ton of money. It's really something you do because you love it and you want to meet readers and Mm -hmm. have that experience and be available for them. Um, And for a long time, I didn't sell any signed books off my website or I didn't have any you know, way to do that. So, so the, like that was it. And I did a couple of year and, and I, and I felt like that was a healthy number. I knew people that got super burned out, hmm. you know, they wanted to do them all and they wanted to make themselves super available, but they got burned out and they spent so much money and they didn't have enough time to write. And so like it was, so one of my advices, I guess, to younger writers is figure out what's comfortable for you and what's doable for you financially. Like be super honest about how much you can afford to do. Mm -hmm. And, and then just do that, you know, make your, you know, give yourself like, I'm going to do two or I'm going to do three, or I'm going to do like one local and one in another place. And like, do something like that and, and just be really clear. Um, And then, and enjoy it, have so much fun and enjoy it for the experience that it is. Don't feel pressure to make your money back. Because you need to not see it as like, this is a money-making enterprise. You need to see it as this is an experience that I'm having with my readers and just enjoy it for what it is. And that takes mm-hmm. a lot of the stress off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great advice. So yeah. uh, I'm looking forward to it. I, I mean, I, I had, you know, like, like most of us um, had events set up in 2020 and 2021 um, that were canceled because of the pandemic. And um, last year, you know, my first trad book came out and I had to do all of my 
promo in virtual events. So I'm zoomed out. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I, you know, I didn't sign up for all the things this year, but I am going to quite a few. Um, one of my publishers asked me to do their two events. And so I'm doing those. So I'm looking forward to seeing readers. I'm looking forward to seeing other authors. Like I, you know, I get to see Rowan because we're in the same city um, and I get to see a couple of other of our local authors, but I haven't seen Avery in person since, actually Avery was the last um, event that we did was uh, Coastal Magic, it was right before everything shut down. That was yeah. the last time. Yeah, that was what, uh, February of 2020? A million years ago. Yeah. And now I'm making you stay. Now I'm yeah. going to be my roommate at Book Bananas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I get to do um, some this year. And I'm and there are, there are events that I haven't done before. So this is like a new readership for me. I'll meet new authors that I haven't met before. So I, I am looking forward. It is a huge undertaking. And I'm, you know, I'm watching the numbers, <laughs> you know, saying like, okay, are we going to be all right? Are things going to get, you know, pulled again? Yeah. And just, you know, haven't booked any flights yet because that's more of a nightmare to cancel than hotels. Than hotel. It's an interesting sort of world we're living in right now when we're trying to do this, trying to do events and meet people. And some places have policies, other places don't. And, you know, so. I do miss it though. Honestly, oh, yeah. I, like I definitely miss it. And I, like I, I mentioned to you guys before we started recording, like I was, I was supposed to do Rare in Paris and I'm so bummed I didn't get to do that. Um, yeah, me too. That was, I, I didn't go because I was like, it's too soon. I just can't, I can't. Edgy, it yeah, it was just like too edgy for, for international or at least European travel. Um, and, our, you know, our visa situation is complicated with all of that. And so it, it's just, but I, so I'm really looking forward to Book Bonanza. Um, I'm, I think that that's the only one I have scheduled for this year. And yeah, I always think it's funny that you take a whole bunch of introverted writers <laughs> and contain them in this very weird bubble for about three days, three, four days, and then we scatter and hide in our rooms for about well, a week afterward. Yes, there's that. <laughs> and then everyone needs to remember to tip your poor hotel barman um, because oh, yeah. the bar staff is never prepared. Never never prepared and also maybe bring your own coffee maker yes <laughs> there are all sorts of tips those little uh your little individual oatmeal packets those are a great way to oh we them. had like a mini kitchen in run and when we, we were in new york remember we had like all that food in the hotel room <laughs> we had all, kinds all of hotel stuff rooms are different but i, I can tell having been to the gaylord texan before there are not coffee makers in the rooms really yeah there are no coffee makers in the rooms and mm -hmm. that coffee line that goes a very, 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 very oh. long way. So my sister and I, my sister's my assistant. She's in, we, we already have a plan. We're bringing an electric kettle. We're bringing a French press. We're bringing our own, we're making our own coffee. We're gonna bring, we're gonna get like a little, you know, we like, you know, coffee milk in our, we're like milk in our coffee. So we're gonna bring like either like that, uh, the, the little boxes, mm -hmm. of like the shelf safe, coffee or so it's like we're not even we're not even doing that nonsense again because that was not okay last mm. time we were like yeah it was pretty place I, is I, huge I, isn't it why would they not enormous. yeah you're gonna it walk 400 miles is yeah. it, it's good it sounds like um yeah. rt in vegas which was my first rt oh, which was like a mile a from one. yeah they, there was no coffee coffee makers in those ones either in mm -hmm. those those uh hotel rooms it's not okay. I just remember walking a mile, like a literal mile from the hotel room to the conference space. Yeah. And yeah. I couldn't figure out why people had like carts and stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? And then I realized, I think I used my suitcase because it had wheels on it to bring yeah. my books <laughs> to the conference room. Oh, Cause yeah. I was like, can't carry these. Is... Wheeled suitcases do a lot of work at book signings. Oh, yeah. I have, well, I saw Avery's cart. So I got one of my own. Um, is it what, a little foldable, like the milk crate yeah, cart? That's I what I got. I think I saw I those at Costco. I'm going to grab one. You know what? Every single like semi smart or brilliant idea I've ever passed along as far as how to haul books around book signings have been from readers. I was going like, to say, yeah. Literally, that's sort of like one of the bonuses of slow times when you're signing is checking out how all of the readers are carrying their 482 books yeah. around. And I'm mm -hmm. like, what do you? What did you get? Because for a while it was like the little collapsible hard crates. Mm -hmm. And then that changed. And then, yeah, when I found when somebody came before they 
outlawed the wagons at the signing. <laughs> little collapsible wagons. The wagons were causing a lot of injuries. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure they were, but it is brilliant. And yes, anytime I can drive to a signing, my wagon comes with me. <laughs> so I'll have my wagon at a polycon, but bracelet. I won't have it at Book Bonanza. Yeah, I'm bringing mine to a polycon, but not Book yeah. Bonanza. Hmm. Yeah, flying with those things. Up. I don't have, I don't have <laughs> the any, first book anything. signing my husband ever went to was the the book Bonanza in Denver. He had just moved to the United States, and he didn't know anything about book world. And that poor man, <laughs> people wanted to take pictures with him. Yeah, people mm-hmm. wanted. Now, to be fair, I'm going to brag a little bit and say my husband is very handsome. <laughs> uh, but so I get it, ladies. I get it. But he was like. I don't ever need to go to a book signing. <laughs> like, my husband won't even go. He won't. Yeah, yeah it's a go. lot. It's a lot. Mine and I are like both. I'm, I'm signing at Rare Saturday. Edinburgh this year. <gasps> and my husband is coming with me. And we are doing like a little vacationing beforehand. And then we're going to end with the signing and then come home. And he's like, I'll help you if you want me to and do all this stuff. And I'm just looking. I'm like, no, no, these we there's volunteers there there who want to be your you you call me by my real name or honey so (laughs) we don't want to cross the streams into avery land we're just not doing that so (laughs) that's a a good call well that's that's number one and number two is you know how hectic those things are i don't want to have to watch out for him too I love you, but there's so much going on. I, I just, I couldn't take care of all of that too. Cause it's so overwhelming. The it's craziest, so overwhelming. It is. And the craziest, I think the craziest story I have is when I brought um, Stuart Reardon, who's a model <gasps> oh with me. That poor man was mobbed. <laughs> we, we couldn't stop in any spot for more than like 10 seconds or a line would form next to him. And he was just like, what is happening? And I was like, <laughs> You need to know, man. I was like, you got fans, man. The reality. It was was so, and people, they were like pushing me aside to get to him. I was like, wow, this is, wow. Have you guys seen The Lost City yet? Not yet. Not yet. It's delightful. (gasps) It's so good. It's delightful. But the the story story reminded reminded me of the, like the Channing Tatum character in The Lost City. And it is, you, you need to go watch it. It will I want to, I'm wonderful. waiting to see it. Yeah. I yeah. love that he just goes all in on that and he totally sticks, his character sticks up for romance and yeah. talking about how important it is and how great it is and it makes people so happy. And oh, it's a wonderful, wonderful, you, you will enjoy it, especially having been to book signings with the cover model. <laughs> all right, Rome, what have, what have your book signing experiences been like? And do you have any tips? um I I got to be Ron's assistant (laughs) I I haven't done that many to be honest um but I have enjoyed all the ones that I've done I get super anxious um like I it I love it and I I really enjoy them but I get very nervous to like I'm the worst at introducing myself to people so like there are authors that I've talked to on Twitter for years and I'm like, I see them over there and I'm like, oh, I should probably go introduce myself to person. And then I'm like, how would one even go about doing that? <laughs> Obviously yeah. I can't. And then I, I say nothing. Um, so yeah, I, I automatically I, fall into the, I'm just a big dork and they were only talking to me to be nice. Yeah. So um, I just won't even pretend that I know them. I, yeah, I, know, I get so nervous. Super, yeah, I, guess I have so been perfect. super forward with one author in my life, and that was Nalini Singh because I'm such a huge Nalini Singh fan <laughs> girl. And I met her, and I was so happy that I was forward because, like, it was very uncomfortable. But I'm like, I will regret this for the rest of my life. Good like, for I you. do not go and tell Nalini Singh how amazing I think she is. So, and the thing is, like, I great. know that it will go well. I know that it will go well in that anytime anyone has ever come up to me and been like this is maybe awkward but I just wanted to whatever it's never awkward for me I'm always like oh I'm always so flattered to me instead of uh, vice versa so I don't know what like it's not logical it's just anxiety but I get very nervous um my but I love meeting readers I love chatting with people um I love like getting to answer questions or anything like that um my biggest advice is bring deodorant with you (laughs) into the signing that's because a, if you're not like, 
I'm a nervous sweater. So the more uh, nervous I get, or like even just doing the podcast, I sweat because it's like I'm talking and there's a thing and I'm not nervous right now, but I'm definitely sweating. Um, so yeah, I like a good, um, and Zio knows this actually from Rare Paris. I do the like, watch out for me and then make sure no one's looking and then I like do a real quick reapply. <laughs> yeah. It's like not during COVID obviously, but usually people want a hug or they want a picture. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to go throw my arm around someone for a picture. And they're going to be like, cool, Rowan Parrish left a disgusting sweat mark on my shoulder with her <laughs> armpit. So at least I want the disgusting. That would be the one thing. thing. Okay. They would probably save that shirt. And Just like they frame it. Yeah. Don't <laughs> they're cloning you sweat. from your DNA as we speak. <laughs> okay. Well, I have to ask this because Elizabeth's uh, statement about, you know, fangirling out with Malini saying, um, who, Zio and Rona have to know who was your fangirl moment that you finally met. I almost cried when I met Carly Phillips for the first time, who is the nicest human being on the face of the earth, but I literally, me, could not talk. So that for me was probably my biggest fangirling moment. My first conference. How about you guys? Well, this was not at a romance con, like a book signing. This was, I went to a signing at the Philly library um, when Donna Tart was touring behind the Goldfinch. And I'm like a, since high school, enormous fan. Um, and I also like, okay. So she, she read from her book. There was a Q and A at the free library. It was great. And then it's like, you buy the book and stand in line. And um, at the time I had these like clear plastic glasses and when I got up to Donna Tart to get my book signed um she was like a radiant glorious completely put together beautiful person and I was like please god don't let her talk to me in any way because I'm gonna lose it <laughs> and um not not because like no I did not thought I was gonna cry I just when I get really nervous I'm just like uh-huh uh-huh and I go into robot mode and so she said, hey, I, I really like your glasses. And I somehow processed that and like had an entire conversation with myself. And then what came out of my mouth was, well, I like basically everything about you to Donna Tart. And then I died and then I went to heaven and I just came here right now and told that story to everyone. I was so <laughs> so awkward thing I've ever heard in my life and I love was, you. It was so awkward. And I mean, Donna Tart is an awkward person. Like she looks amazing and put together, but I think she is also awkward and rather a recluse. And so her response to me, like maybe a more outgoing person would have been like, oh, ha ha, that's so nice. Da, da, da. But she just looked at me and she was like, thank you. And it was it made it so much worse. Anyway. Oh, please don't be a stalker. Be oh gosh. And it's my new favorite story that's involving you. That's, that's a great it. one. That's, that's a, a new one. one. It was bad. I was there by myself, thank God. So I didn't actually have to relate that story immediately to anybody else. And now you <laughs> shared it with everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This will show up in every interview you do from now on. Tell us about the time about you met Donna Tart. Tart. <laughs> oh if we're God. ever on a panel together, I'm going to ask you that. <laughs> 100% bringing that up. I mean, I will fully her. admit it because there's literally zero chance that Donna Tart and I would ever end up in the same place because she's a recluse who writes one brilliant book every 10 years and, uh, you know, will be dead before that happens. So. Can we all agree that when we actually see, uh, see her in person, though, we're just going to say, hey, I love everything, everything about you. About you. <laughs> I'm going to track her down. That's it. <laughs> all right, Zio, how about you? It's hard to top um, that fangirl moment, but yeah, I can't to top that. Um, I, you know, when I, when I started writing romance, I, did, I hadn't read many romance authors. Um, I started to sort of trickle books on my Kindle or whatever, and just be like, okay, let me check this person out. And I saw a free book one day, or it was 99 cents or something like that. And I grabbed it because it seemed like such a ridiculous premise. And I was like, okay, this has to be a, an area of romance I haven't read yet. So I read the book loved it or I, I loved it so much that I hated that I loved it that it worked for me so I read it again and I came really obsessed with this book and I was like how does this work like how did she make this work fast forward to RT in Vegas um at the you know they had those social media fairs where like authors would sit at a different table for like Twitter and Tumblr and whatever and they would like give you advice on how to market yourself on this platforms so I'm talking to this woman 
at the Tumblr table and she was giving advice to someone and we were like, you know, it was like the Spider-Man meme. We're like saying the same stuff and giving the same advice. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like, I would love to follow you. And so I started to like put her information in my phone. She's like, oh, this is not my pen name. This is my real name. I write under Sierra Simone. (gasps) And I was like, (laughs) and I was like, wait, Sierra Simone wrote priest Sierra Simone? And she was like, yeah, you read it? And I was like, oh my God. And so like I had, whatever was in my hand, I think it was like a coffee cup. Okay, some, wait, wait, wait. We have to stop to for floor. a second. Fell to the floor. So for those of you <laughs> listening on the podcast or watching who've never met or seen a picture of Sierra Simone, she <laughs> looks like a cupcake in human form. Like <laughs> she is so cover model. sweet. Yeah, looking. yeah. And she writes dirty, dirty books. They're amazing. <laughs> they're amazing so you you have to put that little yeah it doesn't make sense cognitively thing in there too no it doesn't so, okay go on sorry I just said yeah that that picture no 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 you're absolutely right but whatever was in my hand hit the floor and <laughs> she was she was excited that I had read the book and I couldn't believe that I was talking to the person who had read because I really had what well, was in the middle of my like cycle of reading it like rereading it and stuff and I was like you've got to be kidding me so she she was like can we take a selfie and I was like, yeah. So we did the selfie and she gave me a copy of Porn Star because that was the next book that was coming out. And I was like, and I left, I left the room going like, well, I forget anything else that happened in the conversation or anything. I was just like, oh my God, I just met the woman that wrote this book that I'm like totally obsessed with right now. And she is wonderful and we're friends now and I love her. But that was like the best fangirl moment for me. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, she's awesome. Mm. So, okay. So readers, if you come to a signing and you feel like you've made an idiot of yourself, uh, please know we're right there with you. We all do it. We're all readers who fan out with the authors. Quite frankly. Yeah. There are people that I've signed across the hall from that I couldn't go say hi. Oh, totally. (laughs) Totally. Totally. When we were at Rare Paris, whatever the last time it ran was, I was just like, Zio, can you introduce me to people? (laughs) <laughs> I like, couldn't myself and Zio is so friendly. Yeah. All and I'm like, sudden, I actually know. <laughs> all of a sudden, the, the, uh, the, the, the signing room has turned into a Regency era ballroom. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden you're like, can you introduce me to that <laughs> Duke slash yeah. romance writer over there? I need oh, his name I on my dance card. Been introduced <laughs> yeah. Yes. Let me introduce you to so-and-so. It, it, there is a lot of that going on. Especially there is. For new writers. Mm-hmm. But it's, I mean, I think part of it is we tend to be very introverted by nature. And so when we go to these things, we know we have to be, we have to put on our extroverted face, Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're extroverts. But it even if we are. Be sh- social in short bursts of time. Oh yeah. Um, and then retreat. And I was, yeah, I generally hide in my room. But months. even like authors who are used to introducing themselves like the last time we were all in new york Kristen higgins asked me to introduce her to kennedy ryan and i was like you got like how, one how do you guys not know each other but two like really <laughs> like you had to just walk over and say hi i'm Kristen higgins i really wanted to meet it was just so funny she's like can you introduce me and i was like well yeah uh, that will be my claim to fame i've introduced you guys <laughs> going to fill out your dance card now yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It is a little bit like that though. It's basically that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are looking forward to seeing all everyone at signings if we can bear to make eye contact with you. Um, (laughs) Anyway, thank you so much, Elizabeth Hunter, for being here today. We loved having you. Will you tell everyone again, like where can they find you on the internet? Um, I'm very and show us that beautiful book again. Oh, okay. So the beautiful book is I promise when you get it it will be the right side. Like it's, so it's will be backwards. double oh, vision. I see it. It's I called see it. double no. vision. It's called double vision. And um, it's coming out. This one is coming out April 19th. The sequel is already written. It's at the editor right now. And that's you. coming out in June. Um, yes, I got ahead of my schedule. This I, I did this thing where I like, held back a release and then waited so I could be a book I've had and not be a, a complete mental case. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's worked out really well. And my sister, who is my assistant, is extremely happy with this. Yeah. Anyway, so um, it's coming out April 19. Um, I am very easy to find. My website is elizabethhunterwrites.com. Um, and my handle on all the social medias 
is E. Hunter writes um, because Elizabeth Hunter was taken and she doesn't even tweet. I like to bring this up just in case you are the <laughs> Elizabeth Hunter <clears throat> that owns the Elizabeth Hunter handle, you know, use it or give it up to one <laughs> of us who are, is going to be active on social media. Just, just saying, just putting that out there to the universe. Um, but yeah, the book is out April 19th. It's paranormal women's fiction. It's fun. It's mystery. It's fabulous female friendships. It's uh, characters who are not 25, who are in their 40s and 50s, who um, actually have been there, done that, and are not waiting for a free pass from <laughs> their bad boyfriend. That, that was beautiful. beautiful circling circle. that all together. <laughs> Thank you. A little bit. <laughs> well, that sounds amazing. And Faye, so thank you again. Um, and y'all, thank you so much for hanging out with us for another episode of Dear Romance Writer. Remember, please to send us your questions. We enjoy Reddit as much as the next maladjusted person in their own house. <laughs> But we would love to answer letters from you directly. So yeah. you can hit us up um, on the form on our website, dearromancewriter.com. It has a little form so you can be completely anonymous uh, or you can hit us up on any of our social medias, DM us, tweet at us, do all the, you know, whatever the adverbs thing. related to social media. Send us your letters. We would love to answer them. And uh, yeah, we cannot wait to give you some more questionable advice from this trio of happily ever after enthusiasts. Thanks, y'all. Bye, y'all. Thank you so much for subscribing to Dear Romance Writer. Remember to keep sending in those letters at dearromancewriter.com. We can't wait to tell you what to do. Dear Romance Writer is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love, frolic.media slash podcasts.